Sai AI podcast. This is episode number 18. Today, I have invited Dr. Michael Fu. This is his second time onto the podcast, and I'm really excited to have him here. Dr. Wu, as you might know, is a pioneer in the field of artificial intelligence, data science, machine learning, and behavioral economics. Currently, he works at PROS, an artificial intelligence company in America. Previously, he has worked with a company called Lithium as a chief data scientist. Dr. Wu is a public speaker and have done various public speaking engagements on topics on artificial intelligence and others all around the world. It is a great honor and privilege to have him again. Let's go ahead and get started. The first question that I have for you today is, uh, what is effective computing and how does it help in building the right kind of AGI or general intelligence or just artificial intelligence with the inclusion of cognitive science, psychology and philosophy uh, in it? Yeah, I think effective computing is a relative new area since the advent of AI. I think it's, it's becoming more important. It's an uh, area where AI starts to understand like, human emotion and human kind of expression and the, the affects of a person. So I think that's, that's what effective computing is. And I think the way that it helps us build the right kind of AI or AGI or anything is that it, you know, ultimately, I think these machines, they're, they're, they don't have emotion, right? And right. they need to work with humans like us who have emotion. And when it doesn't have that emotion, when you try to kind of work with someone, someone who have emotion, I think sometimes there's, there could be a understand, misunderstanding in communication or how it how it interprets our responses. So whether we, we like something or we don't like something, like it, it needs to understand that. I mean, so I think without that, I think we'll be talking to a, a cold kind of machine who doesn't, <laughs> you know, feel anything. Mm. Yeah. So, so I think it, it helps us build the right kind of AI because it, it's the AI that we want to use. It's the, it's the AI that we we want to engage and interact with, rather True. than just some just like a digital assistant. I think a perfect example mm -hmm. is a digital assistant today. I mean, I think it's it's, it's helpful. It's you know it's, it's helped me do a lot of things and save me time and give me convenience. But it's not something that I want to talk with. Right? right. It's, not, it's not a friend. It's not right. not a, a person that I like to. This, you know, discuss or share something with, like if I had an exciting day or something like that. So, so it's, it's just a helper. So I think, yeah. So mm -hmm. I think when it has that level of, of intelligence, I think it's, it's better to have this, you know, emotional aspect of it built in, right? So it understands what I want, what I mean. And yeah, I think it ultimately it's going to make the interaction with human and AI or machine a lot better. And I think it is so difficult to actually do that because first of all we haven't understood our brains yet ourselves how can we then put those emotions into an artificial machine wherein you have to i mean what is a machine it's just uh it's just uh zero and ones it's just uh, algorithms so how would you sort of translate an emotion a consciousness of of a human into a, into a machine i think that is something that humans might have to decode and might take a long long time well, I mean, I'm not, I don't think I agree with that, but I, I think that what, what is a human? I mean, it's, it's not more than like firing and not firing of, of a neuron in the brain, right? So sure. It's a collection of so many of the, I think it's a level of abstraction. So mm. when you go from the sensory, like your eye, your ear, getting the, the signal from the environment, right. Right, all the way to the high, high level abstraction that you have in your mm. brain near the frontal cortex. I think that's when you see people like, when you see tear, frown face or something, all these like features, you could think of them as a machine learning features or all these characteristics of, oh, the person is sad. When sad is that's typically associated with, with something. So those things can can be learned. And I guess the, the challenge is really for machines to understand what that truly means. I mean, I think it can learn that, okay, that's, that's he's happy, he's mad and he's, and and he would know that when he's happy, I should respond in a certain way. And he's, or if he's sad, I should respond in a different way. But I don't think he, there's uh, any meaning to the machine 
mm. you know, of sadness or happiness. It's just too, it's just like he could have called, he could have, it's just something called sadness or something called happiness. To the machine, it, it's a one kind of emotion versus another kind versus another kind versus another kind. So it's, it, it could, it could be labeled as one, two, three, emotion, one, two, three, emotional state, one, two, three, four, five. Right. It, for that matter, it doesn't, the machine really doesn't know anything about what those emotional actually mean what it actually feels like mm-hmm. it just know that this is that emotion and i should respond in that that way when a person is in that emotional state and so yeah so i think it's it's not hard for the machine to to know that but i think it's sure. harder for you to truly understand what that means and what it felt so so i so i think that that's a subtle difference i agree i agree yes <laughs> Yes. So in order to build machines with emotions, if we stay to this topic, we need Mm -hmm. the artificial intelligent algorithms to understand facial emotions. Let's start from there, which is also called facial, facial electromyography. How hard is this problem of understanding it and then adding it uh, into the data models to build an AI that can learn, learn this? Yeah, I I think it's, as hard as any other AI problem. I mean, mm-hmm. I think if you had the right data, you can train an AI to understand facial expression and, and emotions that way. Yeah, I think the challenge today is that it's sometimes difficult to, to get those data. I think if you take, a, I would say, a, a video camera and, and start recording people's facial expression every minute, every second of the day, you have enough data, but that would violate people's privacy probably, right. and that wouldn't be very good. So I think there, yeah, if you have the right kind of data, I don't think it's a, it's any particularly hard problem, right? I think you may want to, yeah, okay. I think there there is a, a, a challenge of, I would say, like self-declared emotions. Sometimes emotions are hard to describe by words, right? Sure. You don't really have a word to describe that, that emotion. And when you train a machine, right, you say, okay, when, when you look at, if you look at me, when I'm like sad or something, you say, oh, that's sad, or, or if I'm smiling, and then you say that's happy. You, you put a label on what my emotion is. Mm-hmm. But am I really like happy, or, or maybe I'm, I'm happy, but I'm concerned, I'm worried, I, I'm, I'm excited, but I'm, I'm, I have some, I have some stuff at this afternoon that I have to deal with, that I have a deadline that I'm, I'm also like anxious. Like, so I think you, the emotion is very complex, but when you try to put a label on these emotions, you kind of artificially kind of, I would say, put them in, in one class. You're forcing the machine to treat this as a classification problem, right? Or it may be a multi-class classification. It may be like, it, maybe the answer can be in, in multiple different classes, but but the emotion is, is much more subtle and, and much more complex than that. Maybe we what we really need is we need like the facial expression Mm -hmm. match with some kind of EEG or some collection, you know, collecting our our truly kind of what's going on in our brain or so, so then you could use that as a, as a, as a kind of training data. So once they have that, then yeah, then you can, the machine can actually learn that. Okay. When the, when you have these type of emotion, it's usually associated with these kind of areas of, and, and that seems to be a a sadness or happiness or something like that. Right. So I think it, it needs to have a much wider range of I would say data mm. in order to for you to truly understand what emotion really means mm. and I was just thinking when you were talking about is that there, there could be there can be two scenarios in which you can train the machine like that one is probably you put those sensors on the human face so that the machines mm-hmm. can detect it and sort of see um, when is the facial mm. expressions changing as per any emotion the second and could be a really weird idea could be just show them all the all the movies and programs and everything that mm-hmm. is that exists today on the planet and if the machine could sort of understand that because that's a that's a lot of data that's a lot of rich data that we already have wherein you do not yeah. have to have a sample uh, human to sit and tell all the emotions right yeah i i think that's one way, but the challenge there is that you don't have a the ground truth. You don't have a, right. a label on what the emotion. You, you, yeah, you will have to know how to interpret. Okay, under this situation, this this look like the person should be scared. You know, <laughs> when, the, when you see a, a I don't know a lion in front of a person and he, the expression he make that's a, that's a scare expression or something like that. You know, <laughs> he, he needs to understand that first. Mm. I mean. So other, otherwise, you still need humans go in there and label. Okay, you can show them all the video that you want, but right? so like this person is happy now, he's sad now, he's. But you still need that that label data. That's why I'm saying that 
labeling is, is hard and maybe you True. need to just take this is incomplete maybe you need to take the eeg from the person's yeah. brains directly to and use that as a training data so the machine mm. could truly understand a little bit more the subtlety of these emotions so right. yeah so i think that's that's the, the challenge <laughs> so yeah, getting the right data i mean as as with any ai or machine learning problem getting the right data is, is the hard part once you have that the machine can always i mean mimic it. I mean, this right. AI, as I define it, it's a machine mimicry of, of human. So if you have the data that you needed, you know, the, the machine could, enough, if you have enough, the machine could mimic it. So getting the right data is also important. There is no, I mean, it's yes. abundance of data present, but what kind of data you're feeding is also important. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> Great. I think we have already a great start to some of uh, the questions. But I mean, the next one is also on a more philosophical term, which is like, as you might know, the Greek philosopher Aristotle mentioned that there are two kinds of uh, or branches of knowledge, ontology and mm -hmm. epistem epistemology. Are we going to be ontologically better than AI machines all the time? Or will it topple sometime in the future when they'll be a little better? on understanding how knowledge is understood or how to actually acquire knowledge. So what is your opinion on it? Well, I don't think that's a fair question, first of all, because I don't think that, I don't think AI or, or, or human is better than, than anything. It's anything it's, it depends on what, what ruler you use to measure uh, you yeah. know, us. I mean, if you look at, if, okay, if you want to say like just speed of computation, computer, my laptop is, is can do faster computation than, than what I can. It's better than me in that way. I mean, so, but I can do a lot more things that my laptop can do. I mean, so, I mean, so, so I think it, it matters like what, what ruler you use mm. to measure this, how us measure us against the, the AI. I mean, and I don't think we should say that there's any like better or anything. I think that's, that's sometimes what gets us in trouble because I mean, uh, it's, a, oh, I'm better than, than you. So, so I, I, I have more privilege or, or something or more power or, over you or something. So I, I think that's kind of the thing that we, we really don't want to have, you know, mm. I, I, I mean, humans like to compare, but I, I think that we should learn as a race and as a species to, to appreciate diversity. I mean, a lot of people would say like uh, a human is better than a dog, but, but, but really? I mean, a dog could sniff out like many more older, like than I could sniff, like I could even distinguish in my entire lifetime. Like, mm. I mean, is that, am I really better than him in everything? No, I don't think so. It's, he's just different. I mean, he's just different than, than I am. Mm. So, and so I, I think we should, you know, treat probably machines similarly too. Some machines are just, they, they could be, they could do a lot of things and they could do a lot of different things and they're just different from us. They're just good at different things. I think we will be good at something then the machine probably won't ever be exactly equivalent or match up to in every aspect of our life if you look at like information yeah i mean there's plenty of like system today that if you retrieve all the knowledge on the internet just yeah. search and and it could it could behave as if it's a lot more intelligent than the, any one human is today i mean but is it able to synthesize all those and use it mm. and apply it? so so i think there's yeah so so that's really what I want to get at. You know, it's 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 not really a fair question. It, it depends right. on the ruler, and I and I and I don't think we should always use one ruler to to measure mm. like who's better, or who's who's worse. And I think we should just uh, understand that they're they're just different. Right? And and I think we're good at different things, and we should appreciate what they're good at, and appreciate and also appreciate what we're good at, and so that we have. I would say genuine respect for for human in the in the future probably for machines as well. He's just really good at something. You no, know, he should respect him for that. And uh, so, I agree. And I think uh, the point that w when you said the AI will be different than us, and it is so natural that they will never be able to be exactly like us. The reason being we are being formed or the neurons in our brains are formed by thousands and I think hundreds of thousands of years of evolution. And to expect that to happen to an artificial intelligent machine could be a little unfair. So yeah, I agree. I agree on that point. Yeah. Great. Yeah, great. <laughs> yes. Yep. What is ontology in artificial intelligence? How do we decipher between what is real and what is not real? 
And how do we know, know the perception in an AI algorithm? How do we add that perception in AI algorithm that, hey, listen, this is real and this is unreal. Like, like, like for, for us, we know that this table in front of me is absolutely real, but a video game is unreal because that's virtual. So how would you tell that to a machine to be able to function like that? Well, I mean, so I'm not a philosopher, so I'm not going <laughs> to assume too much about like what I know about ontology. I mean, I, 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 the way I understand it is like, it's a, under, it's a study of the, the, the reality, like what we see, yes. what we, um, you know, the, the fundamental of the science right, a, sure. as it is, right. Rather than the study of kind of abstract concepts. Sure. So, so I would say that what's real and what's not, I, I think in an AI, to an AI is all real. I mean, what he perceived, maybe there is no distinction for an, for an AI when he sees, because all the input stream that's coming in, I mean, and I would say that the difference between what we interpret it as real and what we interpret it as not real is that we have uh, extra kind of modality of, of data stream that comes in. So if we see, if I could render an image that is so realistic, that you cannot tell the difference. Then uh -huh. you then you can't tell the difference. Yeah. Then you, you you cannot tell the difference. And the reason that it's it's not real is because you're missing other sensory you know input. If I only allow you to look at it, you're not allowed to touch it. You're not allowed to smell it. Then then you you would probably not be able to tell. I mean because you visually you, you can distinguish. But but if you're able to touch it, oh that's a hard screen. Right? It has glass here that I cannot actually the, the material is all exactly perfectly the same. I can I don't have a sensory input. I don't have these multi multi streams of input data. But when you have all those, right, then then it's actually not only does it need to render the, the visually, but also render the texture, render it, or you even have to do it in a way that, that makes you uh, tactile sense, mm. your your sense of touch feel the, the same way as if you're touching the real material and all that so, so and then also like maybe that the smell maybe in the, when i'm in a uh, a field of flower I, I should smell fragrance right and if i'm if i see a field of flower but i don't smell anything that, that, that's kind of maybe i i maybe it's not real so so i think like when when you have all these different modality of uh, sensory input then i think it's it's when everything matches then there's there's there is no, I would say distinction between what's real and what's what's not because you you can't mm. tell. I mean, a human mm. cannot cannot really tell. Mm. So yeah, but and I think to an AI, what's real is what's coming in as input to it. And the yeah. AI, it's like sensory. It's fairly, I would say today, fairly limited. I mean, we have a camera, we could capture images, but it, it, it can, we could capture sound. We have a mic, but. Is that it? Does it have all the chemical senses? Does it have all the tactile senses? I mean, so so without those, I, mean, I think what looks and sounds <laughs> realistic is what's real to an AI because that's all they have. That's all the sensory input it have access to. So yeah, so I, I think that's yeah how I think about it. <laughs> that's a great answer. Yes. Yes, absolutely. But I will not leave you without asking you about, uh, so how does epistemology becomes uh, a really critical factor in building the AI? We have discussed about ontology. Mm -hmm. Let's focus on epistemology, which, which actually means how does the only truly working intelligent system, the human brain, models the world innately or by learning it? That's epist epistemology for us. So how do we actually, how does it actually becomes a critical factor when building an AGI or an a AI? The way I understand it is like, Epistemology is the study of kind of abstract ideas or knowledge itself, kind of. So I think it's important for AI because AI is not just a static sure. kind of system, right? It actually right. learned and gain knowledge over time as well. So I think it's good to have that kind of epistemology to help us understand like how AI actually gain this knowledge and and, mm. um, and evolve its knowledge over time with this mm -hmm. experience with like again like with its input like i said before right? ai have multiple different streams of input maybe video visual audio and stuff like maybe it doesn't have the chemical senses right maybe not today right maybe maybe it doesn't have the tactile senses but but i think that yeah how it uses what the the information that they have like vision and auditory information to make sense of the real world and create knowledge and evolve this knowledge yeah i think that 
that is why is important for mm. building AI. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What, according to you, is the future of artificial intelligence? I know I have asked this in our first round, but let me ask you again. What is the future of AI? Will we ever uh, be able to evolve into an even more intelligent being than we are today with the help of our friendly friend, a machine, an artificial intelligent machine, which actually will help us step up to this pedestal? What is your opinion of it? Well, I think we will, if we already are, right? I mean, today, I think, I think even with like system, like DeepMind, kind of AlphaGo, it has trained chess player to play mm. better than they, you know, mm. uh, would have been. So I think machines today is augmenting human where we are not so in areas in, that, that we're not so good at. So I think, I think it's already happening. So, so we are getting, I would say better and, and getting evolving to be more, I would say, smarter, more intelligent with the help uh, of these systems. Right? Mm. So, so I, th I don't think there, there is any doubt that in the future, we will, we will work with these AI. I think, I, I hope the future that I, I like, I like to see, sure. uh, at least I like to be in, and I like if I, if I have children, I don't have any children to, 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 to be, to live in is, is the future that where I would say human can, can kind of live in, in harmony with AI. And just mm. as I think that's how, like, 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 like I said before, I think I might've um, mentioned this in, in the early episode or, mm. or maybe in other talks is okay. that like, I, I feel like the, the way that we ensure that AI don't kill us <laughs> is that we, we teach the AI what it truly means to be a, a good human, right? Teach them like, teach the empathy, right? And if we, if we are kind and, and empathetic to, to people and respect each other, respect differences and not to, oh, you're different than me, you're a different species, so I want to destroy you. Then I think the AI will learn that and not come back and say, oh, hey, you're different than me, I want to destroy you. Mm -hmm. So so I think that's the the kind of world that, that I like to be in, that we sure. can live in harmony and actually have, have respect for each other. So. Mm -hmm. But I mean, uh, what you touched upon is a very idealistic kind of world. What we have seen historically is that you always want to raise a, that is mm -hmm. empathetic, that is morally correct. But when they are actually raised, they sometimes become criminals. They sometimes, be, they, they, they have different goals than what you actually thought about them. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, idealistically, of course, they should live with us in harmony. But what if they don't? And we know... Historically, we have seen many humans have taken advantage of technology and sort of other things. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. well, I mean, I think we can just do the best we can. I mean, we, <laughs> like I said, we can teach AI what it means to be a good human and it's up to them. Right? I mean, we could teach our children to be good humans, but it's up to them to, to whether to live and be a, a, a good human or not. Right. I think that we don't have control over everything we mm. could try to control everything and i think sometimes mm. when we try too hard that is what gets us in trouble sometimes and you know, uh, we need to control this we need to control that and when you try too hard then you end up like sacrificing other things mm. to have that control and mm. i think sometimes that becomes a a, a trade-off that i think is is not uh morally or ethically kind of something that, that I could agree with. Some people, a lot of people would, you know, go to wars or something like that to have control or something like over whether it is resources or, 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 or money or, or something or power. And I think that's, yeah, when you want that too much, then I, I think that's a, a danger. Mm -hmm. Then we could do our best and teach them what it, what it means to be uh, a good human or good AI or good machine to be respectful of each other. And like I said, we, we, we do that if we exhibit all these ourselves. I mean, whatever the future co may come, we really don't have too much control over it. It's just going to take true. its course. And as long as we, maybe that is, you know, the course of every <laughs> civilization is, is to be doomed, right? <laughs> to, yeah. be, to be destroyed. Yes. Uh, I hope not. You know? So, but I, I want to hope and, and think that like, I could live in a world that where people and I would say species or even AI machines can, can live in harmony and be respectful of each other, appreciate each other's differences, appreciate diversity in our ability. And yeah, biological system have their strength 
you know, and resilience. I would say mechanical system like AI or machines, you know, don't don't necessarily have that. So so I think that there's just we're just different, and we need to learn to appreciate those differences and and not so worry about like okay. Are you going to take over me or destroy me or be, make me irrelevant? I think, mm. yeah, we are just different. Right? I mean, are, are, you and I are different, but yes. like, is one of us more relevant than the other? I don't think so. In this society, right. in this world, we should learn to appreciate each other and learn to appreciate all the different diverse perspectives and viewpoints out there. Oh, that's a good point. We can all thrive together and why not the machines with us? Mm-hmm. Yes, but staying on to a little bit of pessimism because I'm also very <laughs> optimistic about AI, but let's still stay there for some more time. So when the AI becomes a phenomena, a need that we can we cannot live without versus just a tool that solves a particular problem, which is today, do you think that we might get embarrassed or humiliated in front of these intelligent machines? The reason why I say this is, is Again, the example that I uh, shared before, we raise our kids to learn better than what we had learned in our life. And hence, most of the times, it is considered that they are smarter and more intelligent than, than the previous generations because they have access to better resources, they have more knowledge, and much more. So then imagine the same way for AI. Our offspring that may not have emotions attached to us as uh, humans, but definitely support us till we die because that's how we built them. But at the same time, be more optimized in doing most tasks like reading, writing, comprehending, imaging, imagining, creating new things. Will that make us like, oh boy, what have I built? And now I don't have any control. I think it's, it's... I have the same view. I mean, I, I yeah. think that, sure, we raise our children to to be better than we are. And I yeah. think we should be happy that they are. I mean, are you not happy that my, I mean, are we, I mean, sometimes I, I'm, I mean, let me ask you a question then. I mean, sure. do you, are you fearful of your children better than you? <laughs> Uh, Are you no, afraid I, that, you, that your kids will surpass you? <laughs> I think I think they should. I think yeah. they. Uh, if, if I'm fortunate, I'm less fortunate to, <laughs> in the in the sense that I don't have children. But I I would like my children to surpass me and be better than me. Yes. And and that's not something that I'm afraid of because I taught them. If I should, in the course of raising them, I taught them to be a, a good human and to respect to be be respectful of difference. I mean, I may not be as smart. I may not remember things as much as he does, but I have a lot more experience than he does. And, and he, should, he, he would respect me or for that. And I should respect him for all the different new ideas, new you know, knowledge that I have access to that I may never have a chance to learn about. And mm-hmm. I think that's the, the thing. And not worry about like you know, control. I mean, yeah, it's out of control. Yeah, but I think that's the beauty of life. Sometimes mm-hmm. they, they get out of control. And I think that's what makes it beauty. If, Beautiful. I mean, mm. uh, if everything is in control, like a machine kind of just zeros and ones and, and everything happened as it should be, then there's no beauty and there's no interesting things in life. I mean, the yeah, everything just, just you know, happens and as predicted. And there's, I would say that's a very boring life. You know? <laughs> it's a life that, that maybe will persist very long, but it loses all the, I would say, meaning and in the, of, of living. You, you'll be subsistent you, you'll be okay you you have food to eat <laughs> you you survive and you you kind of work and do your 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 work and, and you be part of a of this big machinery that keeps the world running but then what's the meaning of it you know is is that all i mean mm-hmm. are we just all keeping this this moving forward and and uh, what's the happiness where's that true happiness if i see a like a, a beautiful scene what's the am i do i feel awe like this is amazing right or, or do i so i think that's what I, what I would say, I think that, yeah, whether it's uh, biological children or, or, this di- or these digital children of ours, like AI and machines, I think they, they, they should be better than us. Mm. And I think we should probably not be too, if we, if we teach them, I mean, if we serve our, as a good example and, and be a good human ourselves and be set a, a, an example of what it means to be a good human, then I don't think we have anything to be afraid of. I think today, uh, those people who everything they they want control, they, they want, and then 
then they should be afraid because the AI that learned from them is going to control them when when they when when the AI have more power. <laughs> so, uh, so so I think it's what comes around goes around. So absolutely, uh, yeah. I agree. Great answer. I love your optimism as well because the more I'm trying to drag you towards, hey, what will happen if AI comes in the future and then it, it might distract us or it might be um, uh, embarrassing us because of their huge intelligence. But you're sticking to the right point. Absolutely love it because yes, we just hope that we will build the right stuff like we have always done in the past. So, yeah, and I think the the thing is that like it. It's it is in our hand. I mean, yes. I think in to some extent that yeah, we we could create something terrible and, <laughs> and something that would be just completely make us re re relevant one day. I and I think that, but how we kind of you know teach this AI to to behave in a more humanistic way, right? To tr really right. treat us as a human, right? And, and appreciate this diversity. Okay, he's a human. He's a different species than, than I am, you know, I should appreciate it rather than just like, oh, he's different. I'm going to rule him. I'm going to control him. I'm going to get him, you know, right. So I think this the same thing. We, today, sometimes I look at the way, you know, we treat some maybe other species like animals or dogs. Yeah. Or, okay. I mean, dogs and cats are, are, I would say good because they're, they have, I would say somewhat of a relationship with human as a yes. species, but sometimes we, we don't treat very kindly to other other species like and i think that's we should be appreciative of a lot of things that we we take from them from whether it's the environment and stuff like that and and just really you know understand that sometimes they are they are sacrificing their environment for for us so what are we sacrificing our life for them mm. right? and, and i think that having the, having that turn the table around sometimes i think right. that's uh very often will give you a different perspective right? mm. so <laughs> That's a beautiful point that you said, turning the table around. Yeah, absolutely. And I think in uh, some of the previous podcasts, maybe or maybe you've mentioned uh, the last time is that we have never built anything wrong. It was just, it was just taken as wrong. So if you see nuclear energy, I mean, it's great for us. It's uh, it's great for humans to sort of uh, use it in good ways. But it was always used as a weapon to to for fear and others, and same as uh, for guns and other stuff. So, yeah, I mean, um, I am also very optimistic that we will the same way we will use the AI in the best way possible, and for sure, in most of the things, AI will definitely help us become better species and progress us more. But I'm just a little bit worried about the wrong people when it gets to their hands. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah I think that's something that like, again, it's, it's really a, a human flaw. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's us. That's, that's somewhat. Right. We are the flaw, most dangerous. Right? Than, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. AI is a tool. And if you put it in the wrong people's hand, then it can do great damage. Right. Yep. Just as, you Absolutely. know, any weapons or any, you know, uh, that we develop, but it can also be very useful to protect us, to generate energy and, and True. to help us solve a lot of very challenging problems that we probably could not solve by ourselves. Right. And yeah, I mean, so I think it, yeah. it is necessary for us to move in that direction, but we should also move cautiously, right? And, and yeah. it is good to have these diversity of voices and opinions. Because sometimes yeah, one person's intelligence is always going to be limited, no matter how smart you are. Right. right. So uh, like I'm very limited in my intelligence. I have right. my domain of expertise, but fortunate to have very diverse educational background and learn a lot of things, but I'm still very limited. Right? There's a lot of things, plenty of things that, that I have no idea about, like, like philosophy. <laughs> we just talk about, right? So, so I, I think that's the, that's the thing. We should appreciate these different diversity. They may not know this area of AI and machine learning. And the question that they ask sometimes may sound stupid, but but they're not. They're mm. genuine concerns from another person. So we should treat it as just, okay, there's a concern. So how, how would I address that concern? Mm. Scientists should really take that, not so perfect, not that it, it just it just doesn't know what he's talking about, right. rather than just taking it, okay, he's, gen he's genuinely just concerned. And yeah. the reason he asks is because he, he really doesn't know. I mean, he, he really, and, and you would probably, I mean, I would probably ask something very, yeah. sound made very stupid in, in other discipline as, as well, because I, mm. I simply don't know. I simply do not know. And I think, yeah, if people have a little bit more patience and, and respect for, for each other, then we would 
try to understand it from their perspective. Mm. He's, he's genuinely concerned, so we should try to address these this issues. So, and very often, more often than not, right, I, I would say it is like concerns raised by these from these other disciplines mm. that really keep us in check. Because what, what we, when we kind of are so kind of focused in, in building an AI or building a, some or a weapon or, or something, we, mm. we may have good intention. We say, oh, it's going to save a lot of people, protect us, generate lots of energy. And, but, and then someone could come along and say like, well, what if this is <laughs> some bad people's hand? What could it do to, to human? Right? So, so that's something that, that they should bring that up. And that's something that they may not have the expertise to solve, but we, we have. We, it is our responsibility to, to think about that and to address some of those concerns as well. Because we have this diversity of kind of opinions right, and concerns, if we respect each other, we would, I would say, tend to keep these dangerous people kind of, or usage, dangerous application in check, right? If you don't have any people questioning, then it's really dangerous because one cool. person could, could, could very easily use that uh, for great harm. So, <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. Great point. Because we are, I'm a computer engineer myself and then worked only with AI and computers in my career. And so is yourself. So, but we don't know how important philosophy is and all these terms and the use of it in AI and AGI and all other things, morality and others, free will and all, which constitute a very, very strong AI. And you're absolutely right. If we do not make sure that they are also being incorporated when we are building it. It's just a dead machine. It's, it may be an intelligent machine for a particular task, but it is not a holistic sort of very, very powerful machine that we are trying to build. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great, great. Love this discussion. I have done some of the podcasts with more guests who had been pioneers in the field of AI, AGI, and some of them shared how important the cognitive architectures are while building the AGI. So how complex do you think uh, the research has uh, become that we can actually uh, see it in reality when it comes to AGI building on the concept of cognitive architectures? Because yeah, otherwise you're building a good tool, but you're not mm. sort of understanding how cognition works and yeah. Yeah, I mean, so let me try to understand, because so I, so I'm not too familiar with this term cognitive architecture. The way I understand it is, so, it's like kind of the, how our brain or not necessarily our brain, but maybe our, our mind is, is organized and architected. I mean, so mm -hmm. I think these are the, I would say functions mm -hmm. that needs to be present for us to create kind of a, a conscious or, or intelligent mind. So, right. so obviously there's need to be uh, sensory uh, mm -hmm. processing. You need to take these sensory information like vision through a camera, take these sensory information from the environment from the environment and, and sound and all these like other so they need to be sensory kind of processing and right and they need to be kind of I would say evaluation of the understanding of the environment and right. then evaluate different choices, different scenarios, right? And then kind of eventually kind of it leads to this kind of, I would say, uh, an output, which is some kind of, uh, for human, is some kind of motor reaction, right? Whether you run away or do you kind of sit here and talk or, or mm. observe. So, 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 yeah, so I think these cognitive architecture, I mean, I, I think that that's what it means to, to me, right? I mean, what mm. kind of function needs to be present? Yeah, I, and I think that that is, is important for building a, an AGI because, mm. If we just keep training a, an AI to do things, you'll be just one task after another, mm. right? You'll be just kind of very specialized one task and you train us to do really, really well. And it will be a tool. You'll be a tool for that task. And then you, you may have many, many tasks, but then you will just be many, many tasks, right? many, many kind of AI <laughs> system, many, many tools. The only thing that when they actually is able to get to the point of being a truly an uh, AGI or, or maybe mm. uh, artificial super intelligent, maybe a smarter mm. human, is the fact that it really needs to be able to learn itself. Mm. Uh, the AI needs to be able to acquire knowledge and, and get you know these information, sensory input from the environment and learn from it by itself. Evaluate the choices that it makes and 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 decide like whether it's a good choice of it. and and they kind of build the knowledge that way. Mm. So I think yeah, it is important in building AI because eventually the AI would need to do probably all of these things. It needs cool. to kind of get information from the environment, evaluate the environment, and then, and then seek 
bunch of options about what action, what decision that it can make in response to these environmental inputs, and then generate some kind of a decision, and which turns into some kind of uh, motor, uh, if it has a uh, legs or arms or or wheels or something like that, to drive away or or, or, go, or walk away or something like that, or or to decide to do something to to change environment, right? So, so I think that's yeah. So I think that's that's in a way that how I see that it's it's going to be important in building an AGI because that eventually for AGI to to become a reality for or ASI, it needs to learn by itself. In that learning process, have to be somewhat of a continuous and and all the all the time, rather than relying on human to train it and teach it every single time. Mm-hmm. And and for it to learn from all the possible environmental input, it needs to have all these functions that's outlined by, I would say, cognitive architecture. Mm. So. Love that answer. Fantastic. And absolutely, I mean, I don't need that you should say the in-depth uh, knowledge about cognitive architectures, but how you understand it is absolutely beautiful. So, yep. Uh, well, great. I mean, <laughs> Are we the only species who can develop language? If yes, then how is it possible? The reason why I asked uh, this question is because it is commonly termed by scientists that the consciousness in human beings is the direct result of our ability to develop languages, right? So when we are building a conscious artificial intelligence machine for the future, we then need to completely understand how language comes inside this conscious being. So what do you think? Mm -hmm. I, I can see the language is very important for, for consciousness and self-consciousness, but I don't know if that's actually absolutely required, though. I mean, mm. yeah, I, I, and I, I would say that it's, it's a very important and certainly it's, it's what fairly uniquely distinguishes human from, from other species. I mean, so, yeah, and, and I think that we could, I could just say that maybe a lot of language is not as expressive as a human language, right? I mean, mm. a, I mean, a dog may want something. It could bark. It could, you know, mm. it could use its body language to try to tell you that it wants something. There's, I think there's a there's a need to communicate, and then there's a language that does serve that purpose, the need to communicate, and then there's also a evolution of that to the next level, where a, a language that serve the need to to express to self express and also like and in a sense i think that's probably why it's, it's important in i would say consciousness because in, mm-hmm. a lot of times we used to understand people's expression to understand self expression self aware so so these type of things are, are what distinguishes hu- uh, human when you don't even have the language to to describe that it's very hard for us to to understand what that what that truly means what is conscious mean if, if you can't even articulate that mm. it's very hard for us to understand then so, does it so mean, I, I, again then does it mean that even so not just uh, the language but even the speech the eyes are also important so perhaps some animals who cannot actually talk mm-hmm. cannot be yeah. conscious the only reason being they cannot communicate what they actually want to communicate to their other counterpart so perhaps you th- perhaps yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think yeah, and I think like I think to your maybe earlier question like can lang- is human the only uh, species that could that develop language? I mean, I right. think to develop language to this extent as as human language, yeah, we we are probably the only one that developed the language to this extent. But the, I don't I don't think that we should think that that, that, that we are unique in, in that way. I mean, I, mm. I think that like we might be. Yeah, so far, <laughs> we, we are the only species, but we are not the end of the evolutionary ladder. And sometimes we, we are evolving today, too. We are yeah. kind of becoming a semi-digital reliance species and that, that we, we used to be not. So, so, so I, I would say that languages can, can be developed. I, I, I'm, I don't have proof for it because mm. you know, we, we are so far the only species that, that have developed language to this level. Mm. So that, that allow us to to self-express, be conscious, be aware. But I would think that like there, if you look at language as a means to communicate, then I think a lot of other animals have this disability. They're just not at this level where they could right. actually express and, and be aware, ex- exhibit awareness. Mm. Yeah. So I, I don't want to, yeah. So again, right, I, I, I think that a lot of things are, are, possible in a sense that they that they don't violate any physical or biological law yeah so it, it hasn't happened but it doesn't mean that you will never happen 
Mm -hmm. it's, it, it just it just hasn't happened because we are so far the the most developed species in terms of the, our language ability. Yeah, and I would say that maybe other some I don't know a thousand year you know, or yeah. maybe you know ten thousand year later or something or, or maybe you know in the evolu whatever time scale that you want to talk about in the evolutionary time scale that makes sense. There will be some maybe some other species that are maybe far more advanced than we are. And, yeah. and then we know that, for example, dolphins and you know, like yeah. and whales, you know, they have acolyte ability to 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 kind of communicate with each other just in a in a fairly intelligent way. And and yeah, True. so and they have these kind of social structures and and very much like human. But they, they, they're not their language is something that we don't understand yet. And but I, I would say I would say that it's sim just simply that we don't understand. I don't I don't want to say that they don't exist. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I absolutely love the fact uh, um, that the evolutionary scale that you mentioned that we actually see it from a very our point of view. But if you if we look at if we look at other species, perhaps like chimps or dolphins, like you said, what if not now, but after five thousand years or ten thousand years, they might develop that la language, which is as per evolution they have just started. So yeah, they might become conscious as well, and uh, you never know how what what kind of creature they will become once they develop it because we are not the same species uh, like Neanderthals or even before that, the early humans. So, yeah. So, yeah. Hmm? And, I, and I think sometimes, a lot of times, I, I think sometimes humans take for granted this, this fact that I think the reason that we, we are able to develop is that the environment is actually conducive for us to do so. True. If hmm. the environment changes completely, then we would not, exist no. i mean no. we will not be the, the thriving species you know uh, that governs right. the world anymore let's say that the, the planet is flooded right mm. uh, and there's like 99.999 percent of the world is covered in water okay. i don't think that we would be as it's, it's not conducive for this species the right. human species to 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 be um in charge of everything but it may be more conducive for another species to mm. to thrive at, at that time so like again so i think yeah we got lucky in the sense That's that the right. environment allow us to to thrive mm -hmm. and and be be us to, to live out the the full potential for for being us. But if the environment changes, then whatever we we are perfected over the mm -hmm. over the, the millions of years of, of, of evolution may be completely irrelevant. That's that's right. why this, this ability to, to adapt is so important. It's, it's really because environment could, could change it and it's changing every day look at COVID, right? So uh, right. It, it, it's very easy to kind of disrupt us if, if the environment is not choose not to be so kind to us and i think that True. you know so we in some sense need to be a little bit more aware of what we do to the environment because we, if mm. the environment is not presents itself in a favorable condition for us then there's no chance we don't mm. even have the power to even ask the question. You know, we, if the environment don't let you survive, you would just die. If there's no That's oxygen true. or there's not, you, no water, we would just die out as a species. Mm. So, yeah. So, so we we've been very lucky, and I and I think that and sometimes we need to reflect and and think back and think that like, wow, we should appreciate that and really, I would say also be more kind to the environment mm. too. So continue to to have these favorable conditions for us to survive, to, to thrive and not be turned into a, a turn into evolve into some other conditions where some other species may take over us. Right. So great point. Absolutely. Wonderful point. And that bags another point with it, which is like, if that's the case due to any natural calamity or by any human intervention, mm -hmm. if we are not going to exist because this is our only uh, home right now, then shouldn't we actually look for another home as well, like a copy, like a backup, like something like Elon Musk is doing right now, trying to uh, take us to another planet. Many people criticize him, but I think I love the fact that he's trying to create a backup for us because you never know when yeah. a calamity happens. The dinosaurs yes. didn't have a plan B, an asteroid hit and whoop, everything's gone. And uh, perhaps yes. it can happen with the same with, with, with us as well. So, yeah. Yes, I I, tr I totally agree with that. I mean, I think I think Elon Musk is is doing the right thing. I mean, I think maybe the the proportion at which he do it, right? Maybe not to people's liking, but I, mm. I admire him, and I think that he's doing right. something good. I mean, I think he should. We need we do need to look for uh, a plan B. 
like I said, if the environment changes and become not conducive for us to thrive and, and live and survive, we have no chance. Mm. This, our powers are absolutely no match <laughs> to nature's kind of, it's, it's just absolutely, take a look at this, a COVID, right? A sure. pandemic, it's, 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 it's enough to, little tiny virus could, could, what, what it could do to, to, to us. Yes. I mean, if the environment become hostile to us, we have absolutely no chance mm -hmm. to, to, to survive it. So, mm -hmm. so I think, yeah, so I, I, I understand why other people, some people would criticize uh, Elon Musk. I think that there's so many other problems in the earth that, that we mm -hmm. have to deal with, right? Why don't you have to solve those problems first, those more immediate problems. But so here's where I think that just diversity needs, needs to play in. I mean, somebody sure. needs to ask those tough questions that's out there. I mean, there are other people, there are lots of other people who are solving the problem that we we are uh, of, of addressing our needs our that we're facing right now on earth somebody right. needs to solve the problem of do we have a home elsewhere <laughs> somebody need to, need to be out there this is yeah. a different perspective that diversity mm -hmm. is what's going to ensure our survival i mean whatever future may come it's just going to be one future right it's going to evolve in one way right? but which way it's going to go we don't mm -hmm. really know so if you don't explore have enough people to explore all these different ways, different possible futures, then then we may miss some. And most likely we, we will miss some. But then the fact the fact that the more people actually explore different scenarios and try to address them is provides us a better chance. The odds are the odds are in some way always against us. Right? Absolutely. So the only yeah. thing that we have is like I said, the environment has been very kind to us. Right? Yeah. It's been very conducive. And so yeah. that's kind of we could if we just keep the environment the way it is and maintain it, right? Maintain it, keep it, meaning like keep it the same way as when we were born and not kind of destroy or, or, yeah. or, you know, yeah. Then, then I think we have, we have, we have a good chance to, to stay, right? <laughs> if we could try to keep it the same, but if, if not, then we are our own demise. I would say. Right. Yeah. So. And, and, and great point. And my point is like, if we are not just four people on the planet, we are like 8 billion. So if some of them want to think something else, like you said about diversity, right? If somebody wants to think and uh, a million about uh, want to support him to go to some other planet to find another home for us, which could be possible because we are intelligent. We have done so much already in the last three, five, 300 or 500 mm -hmm. years. Why not we do it? So, I mean, I just don't like the people who just criticize that of course, they're right that uh, we have to first deal with climate change. We have to first make sure that people are not, nobody's on the earth is poor, stays hungry, mm -hmm. secured, everything. Absolutely right. But at the same time, can not can we not just find a plan B for us? Um, he, yeah. he just one person. I mean, yes. he's just, why, why don't you, why, why can't we even accept one person having a different idea? If we cannot even accept that, I mean, maybe... Our species should be should 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 not exist forever. Right? <laughs> Maybe that's a good thing because because I mean if we're so not able to accommodate differences, mm. then yeah, then I'm, I'm sorry. I mean I, I really have to say that I'm sorry mm. for mm. species for those people yeah. who are so narrow minded. And but I I I don't want to live that way, and I Absolutely. don't want to I don't look at the world that way. And I think mm. it's it's great to have these different people solving different problem potential problem mm. and. And it's actually not like unreal. It's actually very real. These problems mm -hmm. are, yeah, maybe the, you, you don't feel it right now, but if we only mm -hmm. look at the urgent things right now and nobody solved the long-term problem, then it's a problem also because mm -hmm. we've done a lot of things that may seem harmless in the short term, but actually very harmful to our environment in the long term. Right? That's absolutely right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Great discussion. Then I have one more question to you. And uh, if we come back to a very hardcore AI kind of issue, sure. uh, mm -hmm. how much, how much human is GPT-3? How close uh, is it to passing a Turing test? As we might have heard about the Turing test a lot of times. Can you share the knowledge of, in terms of, of an example, like how would a human will react to questions and how would a GPT-3 will? Yeah. So, well, like I said, I think the main difference is that like the human actually understand the, the meaning of what they're saying. The GT, GPT-3, it's a language kind of word. It's, it's playing a, essentially a pre word prediction game. Yes. It's, it's really predicting the next like most likely word and then, and then use that, that sentence to create the sentences and, and then the, the, the text that it, it generates for you. 
So I, I think that it, I don't think, honestly, I don't think it will pass the Turing test today, you know, because <laughs> you, you could, you could think that it's, it, it, it's okay. I, I was, okay. Maybe I step, let me step back a little sure. bit. I would say that maybe you, you, it will pass the Turing test if you're a very loose kind of judge, right? I would say that. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I think the way I look at G, GPT-3 is like, it's, it's like a person kind of, you know, having a stream of consciousness reading out kind of like mm. it's, it's kind of whatever word comes to mind it just says it and then and then you know in a sentence whatever you want so so it's like a person's half drunk or, or something or half sober right and right. and just saying whatever is in his mind it's taking the most likely words you know what is based on whatever it's so the gpt3 is it's essentially a, a neural network that with the attention mechanism so so let's we were, so we were talking about gpt3 i mean so like right. again like gpt3 like i said before it's, it's just uh a neural network with, with, with essentially a attention mechanism. So, right. so based on what so you're thinking about, right? You're attend you're tending to. Mm -hmm. It's going to give you different words. It, again, the fun the foundation of it is really a, a word prediction. It predicts the next words. Like right? given the the sentence that you have so far, if I say the the sky is right, next most likely word is probably blue, right? Blue. Or right. or some other. They're based on other sentences that you said before, and you can say like, oh. Today is very cloudy. The sky is then maybe maybe the next the, the most next likely probable word is, is gray or, or dark or something like that. So right. based on these other sentences that, that you have before. So so it's looking at all the text that it has generated and, and essentially playing a, a word prediction game. So and then the, so the, if that's the case, right? Then you say, well, wouldn't it just generate the same text all the time if I if I type in the same kind of words for you to right. to use it as a seed? But the, yeah, so the, the only thing that makes it kind of a little bit more random is this attention mechanism based mm. on what is the thinking what is attending to right if i'm attending to actually some something or traveling or in the caribbean then maybe the sky, the sky is blue the next word should be blue but if i'm attending to like oh i hear the forecast is going to have a storm today then maybe the, the next word is the most likely word is not because i'm attending to something about the rain maybe it's uh -huh. gray or dark so 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 this 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 mechanism of attention is what give a lot of uh, this, I would say, human-like um, behavior of GPT-3. Mm. But in reality, what what is actually uh, doing is, is still based on this word prediction game. It's going to be much the next most likely word. So if you, if the way I like to think about it, it's it's, it's really like a kind of a stream of consciousness for a human. If you are just thinking about all the words that comes to you and just say it out, out loud then that's mm. and in a, in a sentence uh, whatever comes to your mind is thinking then that's kind of like a gpt3 it's it's it makes sense it's a sentence it's a it's because it, it's humans say that sentence but but it's not necessarily i would say have any too much meaning or something like that i would right. say it, it may have some meaning from other contexts but these words are actually trained <laughs> with with text from human right so it, it may drawn from a huge repertoire of of text data, so so mm. that's where it, it kind of derives its its kind of all the the, the other context that that they may seem realistic to to humans before. Right. But if you type in some I don't know some some C text and ask the the GPT three to to complete it, it some it, it I, I would say that most of the time it would sound like I'm talking to to someone who's kind of I would say half sober, right? half drunk type of situation, right? So, <laughs> yeah, you will make some sense as if it's, 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 I'm talking to a human, but I, I'm, if I talk with it long enough, I'm not so sure. But yeah, it's, I would say that like, if you think about it, I think there are, there are tests that people have done. They put like texts or, or blocks out generated by completely right. with, with these uh, GPT-3, you know, like, or maybe not GPT-3 or GPT-2 or, you know, gen gen GPT stands for Generative Pre-Trained -pre Transformer. Yeah. So Transformer is this neural network architecture that right. um, that's very suitable for, for modeling languages. So, yeah, and I think initially, if you take a, if you take a quick scheme at it, they, they look good. But if you, over time, if you, a lot of people are looking at it, hundreds and thousands and, and ten thousands of people looking at it. Some people would say, this is a little weird. And then, you know, <laughs> guess what? They were, so again, <laughs> This is the idea of that diversity. If you have, if you have one person looking at it, you may not find any problem. Mm -hmm. You have uh, enough people with enough background. Maybe he talk about how come he talk about this term and it's used in this context. Maybe in some expertise of maybe he's a I don't know a medical doctor. In this context, it's, it's actually, it actually doesn't make sense. You know, mm -hmm. so 
So only maybe the expert, like a, a doctor or, or some some other discipline or some other mm. experts would would, would 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 notice that, and other experts, uh, you know, in their respective area, probably would not have noticed or even mm. caught it. So I think that's to answer your question. I would say, I would say humans are not GPT three at all. <laughs> I think, yeah. I would say how much how much human is to be. I would say like I would say very low. I mean I would say right. like, you know probably less than five percent at the right. time. I think that the key thing is is really the uh, understanding of of the meaning of what they're saying rather than just using the correlation. If I'm playing the prediction game, word prediction game, well, even with this attention mechanism, I'm actually using the correlation. These words tend to correlate with with these a whole set of words that I've said before. Right. So I'm going to use, pick that as my next most likely word. And then I'll pick the next word and I'll pick the next word. They're all based on correlation and probability. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's not really understanding the meaning of, of what they actually said. You know? mm -hmm. so, yeah. And how do you think the GPT-4 or the GPT-5s, the future GPTs might evolve? What is your idea about it? How do you see it evolving? Yeah, I, I think that it will develop to be more human-like if you start to understand the, I would say, that the causality in the, in the, in the world. I would say right. that it doesn't understand a lot of things, of how our physical world operates. So I, I would say that it's very simple things that, that you, it would fail. I mean, I think if you describe a physical scenario or situation that doesn't happen very frequent very, or very commonly, and then GPT-3 will probably fail to understand completely what that means. And some mm -hmm. of these may be common sense. If I'm, if I push this, <laughs> oh, it's going to tip over. It's a common sense for us. But I think that for, if I describe, I, I think I could craft probably some scenario where the GPT-3 would, would fail miserably, mm -hmm. just using simple physics, right? It's for phenomena that probably doesn't, doesn't, people don't talk about very often, right? Because again, right, it's, if people talk about it frequently, then it's, it's going to, reflect it in our language and GPT-3 would have the training data to model that and mimic that and that would be that would be fine. They will, they will react the way as we expected because other people have already responded to those type of <laughs> inquiries in the, mm. the past. But if you pick a scenario where, where people don't often talk about it and it's a very simple physical phenomena, I would say that GPT probably have zero understanding of the causality mm. of how the world actually works. Mm. Mm. So, oh, that's a great <laughs> point, yeah. <clears throat> Fantastic. Love this answer as well. So I have exhausted all the uh, questions I have and this is how we end. But before we end, like as, like as a tradition, Michael, what are your parting thoughts or do you want to share something else with us? Well, I mean, I think we there's a lot of parting thoughts. I mean, <laughs> I mean today I, I think I, I focused a lot on this concept of, of kind of ha having this this diversity uh, appreciate diversity and, mm -hmm. and i think diversity sometimes make our life cumbersome and and kind of maybe less if it i would say less efficient mm -hmm. and, and and because there's so many different voices i have mm -hmm. to you know under and, and it's kind of sometimes frustrating but but i think we should learn to appreciate that as a species and i think that's what the inputs from from those voices it's what's going to actually help us build better AI, and, but also help us evolve and become a, a better uh, species ourselves, and mm -hmm. which we can in turn be a, a better role model for the AI who actually learn from us. <laughs> so, mm. yeah. I agree, because that might delay us for some time, but it will build a very, very strong AI because of the kind of diversity that you're mentioning. So Yeah, I think if you look at it in the short term, <laughs> it, it may be... It may be, it just, it, I think this, this time horizon, it's, it's right. time people think about it it's, it's differently. If you look at it from a, a, a very short-term perspective, mm. it may delay us. But if you look at it from a long time horizon, it may actually help us advance further because we build a much better AI. If you don't build a, a really human AI that's that will kind of that's going to live with us in, in in harmony. Maybe after a, a hundred years, this AI will come and destroy us. <laughs> and from the from the long time scale, that actually is a lot. We're not going to survive as long. I think in the long, if you look, if you really look at it in a longer time horizon, mm -hmm. this is actually a, a, a much you know uh, better um, you know perspective. You, you actually get us further. In, it, 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 in the short term, it, it seems like it's hindering us. But I think mm. it's it's actually not. It's actually uh, helping us uh, move faster towards a, a future that we, that we want. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Yes, absolutely. I agree. The foundation should be strong and then whatever you will build on it will always be really, really strong. So fantastic. I had Great. so much fun. Thank you, Michael, for coming for the second round. Appreciate it. Maybe sure. I will bother you again for another round. Sure. Yeah. yeah? yeah. I, I'm happy to, to contribute whenever. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All the best for everything that you're doing. Thank you for coming. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Thank you for listening to this podcast. Please support this podcast by liking, commenting, sharing it with your friends, and also subscribing to this channel. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.